hello, hi everyone. So my name is Jen, and, and I'm currently a postdoc fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems. And uh, a little bit of introduction of our society. And uh, the Mathlet Society is a community uh, for young scholars to build connections and to share uh, their work and to share their ideas and freely and equally. So currently we have three uh, categories of uh, events. And the first one is TMS Talk, uh, which focuses on uh, academic research and also the popularization of a science. And uh, another one is called WBA Talk, where we focus on the, uh, the world beyond academia. And then we also have a TMS Talk workshop, which will help you to build your skill sets either for academia or for uh, other uh, the, for the uh, fields out, outside of academia. And please follow us on the uh, uh, on WeChat, our WeChat channel and also our Twitter channel for more information. You can scan the QR code here. And you can also check our official websites. And if you want to be a speaker or want to be a host or have any suggestions, please email us. Uh, the email is here. So, uh, this season, is, uh, this talk is the last last episode of our, uh, it's the season finale of our uh, season one TMS talk. And uh, now we have like uh, all this season, we have, we have all these uh, seven wonderful talks. And uh, please, uh, you can check out our website for all those talks. And uh, we just had a very wonderful four seasons. And the season two will begin uh, in December. and. Uh, uh, let's keep in, uh, uh, we will we'll update you with all the wonderful new seasons as well. The new seasons will add more diversity and also very new, very interesting talks as well. So uh, then I will give the time to uh, Dr. Lee, uh, Jun Lee, and to uh, give an introduction uh, of our talk, uh, today's talk. Yeah, please go ahead, Dr. Dr. Lee. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, uh, sounds good, great. Okay, uh, first of all, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today with our TMS talk. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself a little bit. So uh, my name is Jun, uh, and uh, I'm currently a Mercury Post Fellow in the laboratory of Photonic Interfaces, uh, directed by Professor Michael Gresso at EPFL. And, uh, I'm currently working on uh, solar fuels. Basically, we use uh, uh, sunlight to drive, uh, to drive our um, uh, reaction for the um, uh, uh, re uh, electrochemical reduction of uh, CO2. And uh, our um, uh, basically, our aim is to basically to produce uh, um, renewable chemical and fuels. And uh, today, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Feng Wang Li from the University of Sydney. Um, Dr. Feng Wang Li is currently a lecturer, uh, AKA, works known as Tenure Track System Professor in the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Sydney, Australia. Before, Feng Wang was working with Professor Tess Argent uh, and the University of Toronto, Canada as a postdoc fellow. And he completed his PhD degree at Monash University, Australia, under the direction of Professor Jie Zhang and Professor Douglas McFarney. Fluence research aims to tackle global energy and climate concern in the context of global warming and energy crisis, with his focus to conduct cutting-edge research on um, material synthesis and system designs to generate uh, renewable chemicals and fuels from the uh, electrochemical reduction of carbon dioxide. Fluence has been very productive in his research career, and he has so far published more than 50 research articles, including nature, science, nature catalysis, nature material, etc. His work has have been studied over 2,500 times, and he has a H index of 27 based on Google Scholar. Due to his excellent research performance, Feng Wang uh, was awarded the uh, Moni Holland Medal at Monash University for the best PhD thesis. So today, Dr. Feng Wang will give us a talk on molecular tuning of electrochemical CO2 uh, conversion. Before we get started, I, I also would like to introduce two of our distinguished guests, um, Mr. Uh, Xiang Quan Chao and uh, Mr. Bing 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 uh, to join us in the Q&A uh, Q section right after Fong's talk. Both Xiang Kuen and Bing Bing are currently PhD candidates at 
Cornell University and McGill University, respectively. They will, be, uh, they will bring us more insights uh, from their research field as well as some non-academic experience. Ideally, a uh, suited for people who want to pursue a career, a career outside of academia. Yeah, Dr. Lee, you can share your screen right now. Yeah. You can see that screen. So, uh, can you see the screen? Um, somebody gave me an indication. Uh, yeah, yeah, we can see our screen right now. Okay. Yeah, that's great. I may stop my video to ensure the network connection. So uh, thank you for uh, all the audience and the thanks for Jun and Yang Fan for the nice introduction and thank you TMS for the invitation to today's talk. It's really a great opportunity for me to present my research under the current extraordinary conditions. Uh, due to the uh, developmental network, we can share our science globally, even if we are restrict, restricted at home. Uh, I really appreciate the TMS opportunity. Okay, yeah, so um, the Industrial Revolution brought us a lot of CO2 emission, as we can see from the right figure. After the Industrial Revolution, it, uh, we have a currently a uh, global CO2 concentration of more than 400 uh, ppm and it is still currently uh, growing uh, in a very rapid manner. So this brought us, uh, this brought us the, uh, in, the increase of global average temperature, although the number is, is small, it's only around one degree uh, C, but uh, the, it, uh, uh, it changes the global like a temperature and the global sea level and the destroy a lot of uh, wildlife uh, for now and uh, in the future. So we needed to rethink how uh, how we can re revolution revolute the industry in a more sustainable way and a greener way. So today's. Uh, Today's uh, currently the global strategy is to deploy the renewable energy. Uh, that means the the electricity from solar farm, from uh, wind farm. Um, this can uh, shift our reliance on renewable uh, on fossil fuels uh, to the reliance on the more clean and uh, more renew more renewable, more sustainable electricity. As we can see from the right figure, the total energy uh, electricity generation from the these clean sources are growing very rapidly, especially in uh, the big countries like China, United States, uh, which emits the most CO2 in the world uh, over the past uh, uh, 30, 30 years. So at the same time, due to the uh, increasing uh, capacity of the electricity, the uh, price of the clean uh, electricity from here, I use uh, solar as an example, the price is decreasing rapidly. Now it can be competitive to the uh, electricity from uh, renewable, from uh, traditional fossil fuels. This gives us a huge opportunity to deploy the renewable electricity in a large scale, but uh, there are still some uh, like this this advantage, or we can call it a uh, mismatch of the renewable electricity. The first one is the renewable energy is usually intermittent. It's largely uh, geography dependent and uh, weather dependent. For example, for the uh, wind farm, if uh, if there is no wind, then there is no electricity. For the solar uh, farm, it's uh, it, it's easy to imagine that during night, there will be no electricity generated. That means uh, we we needed to uh, we needed 
we, we, we needed to uh, balance the energy capacity uh, under different conditions. And uh, this also means that we needed to develop the energy storage uh, technology to store the excess electricity at uh, some time and uh, then to uh, inject uh, uh, more electricity into the electric electrical grid when the uh, electricity is not uh, enough. That's also uh, mean that for the, in the, for the future, once we generate the electricity, we need to transport the electricity from uh, like a rural, uh, from like the regional uh, area where there are abundant uh, wind or abundant sunlight to uh, the places where we need the electricity the most. Uh, but the, the price for the uh, electricity transport is not that low and uh, there will be some losses during transport. Um, so if we can transport the el renewable electricity in a way that is more, that is cheaper and uh, more efficient, that would be great. And uh, the last, the last point is that in any way we still need uh, chemicals and fuel. For example, we cannot uh, wear electricity we need to wear like the clothes uh, which is made uh, largely from the syn synthetic chemicals for nowadays and uh, we also need a fuel for example for airplane currently there are no uh, large scale electrical uh, airplane i know there are small, some smaller ones under development so we if we can develop the electrification uh, method for the use of, for the more uh, economically use of molecular, we can, uh, we can like uh, overcome the short, the disadvantage of the renewable electricity. For example, if we, we can uh, electrification of water and nitrogen and the CO2 generated in the atmosphere or generated from the industry, uh, we can use the electricity to convert these chemicals into useful uh, chemicals, for example, fertilizer from nitrogen, uh, right. some uh, commodity chemicals from CO2, and uh, even fuels from CO2 and water. We can call it green chemical, green chemical or green fuel because it comes from the combination of uh, renewable sources and renewable electricity. Once we have these chemicals, even if we use it still for like a transport for food, for chemicals, and it emits again CO2, it closes the uh, overall carbon cycle or uh, hydrogen cycle and the nitrogen cycle to make the society more sustainable. So the key component in this closed uh, cycle is the electrolysis process. So electrolysis, uh, it's not so very uh, easy to describe. It composes a range of different uh, components, but in any way, it uh, mainly contains the cathode catalyst on the left side and the anode catalyst on the right side, and uh, it is separated usually by an ion exchange membrane to let the ions conduct, and, and it is a multi-scale uh, process from like a sub nanometer to several micrometer and to even for the, and for the overall reactor to millimeter and centimeter. So if we look at the catalyst, uh, the catalyst on the uh, cathode side, we use it and as an example, um, once we apply a negative voltage, it will, due to the charge balance, uh, it will attract uh, the po positively charged ion and uh, the potential will drop due to the uh, electrical screen effect and uh, finally it will reach the potential will reach zero and at this uh, scale uh, the, the species uh, is diffused uh, from the bulk solution to the uh, surface which is called the diffusion layer that means you're in the overall reactor it, it contains 
several different uh, components with different uh, properties. We need to take, take care of all the each of them uh, in the design of the reactor and the design of the uh, material. But in anyway, so the cathode the catalyst here uh, on uh, not only the cathode catalyst but the ca catalyst on both cathode and another side are the most critical one. If one really want to uh, have some breakthrough to develop more efficient and uh, more selective reactor that can be de uh, deployed in a large scale in industry. So this comes to today's uh, major topic, uh, which is uh, molecular tuning of the catalyst design. I use a CO2 reduction as an example uh, because this is the most uh, not the most uh, not the most developed uh, one, but uh, it is because it is uh, it is a very complicated reaction and it is all important to the close of carbon cycle. So CO2 reduction involves the reduction of CO2 and the water uh, plus electron to uh, hydrocarbon or to CO or to product and uh, at the same time uh, generates uh, uh, OH uh, I. So it's complicated because it can generate a range of products. For example, uh, in a paper reported by uh, Professor Haramiro, they report uh, 16 different products from one single CO2 reduction uh, reaction. And uh, if we take a look at the reaction again, it also involves involve water, but the water is usually uh, easier to be reduced compared to CO2. That means for the CO2 reduction, it's not only needed to compete with water reduction, but also in each reaction, one product needed to compete with another. So if we really want to develop uh, the CO2 reduction technology to be practical, we needed to make the reaction to be more selective as uh, when, if it's more selective, we need less money to uh, for the further product separation and the purification process. And uh, we can also aim for uh, products with high economic value. So in terms of the economic value, uh, the Sargent group has done a very simple technical economic analysis and found that for almost all the CO2 products, uh, from CO2 reduction, it can potentially be uh, economically competitive compared to the current market for, uh, market price, price, which are based on uh, fossil fuel, as long as the CO2 reduction uh, reaction is selective enough and energy efficient enough. This means that uh, there is a high need for the development of highly selective and highly efficient catalyst to drive the reaction. So in the, in the conventional catalyst design, people are focused on the catalyst itself. Uh, actually, it's not so conventional because it's anyway a nanotechnology which are developed in, uh, in a rapid way over the past 30 years. So people use, uh, people can synthesize almost all kinds of nanomaterials in different particle size, in different crystal facets uh, with different shapes, for example, nanosphere, nanocube, nanorod, nanowire. And uh, it, people can also introduce different effects, for example, the subsurface atom, or introduce more green boundaries to increase the activity and the selectivity of, of the catalyst. So in our strategy, we focus on a different way. We don't modify the catalyst itself. That means we just use the most simple way to prepare catalyst, but we focus on the modification of catalyst with, with the additional functional layer. Using this functional layer, we are aiming to tune the, the local environment of the catalyst. And we have uh, briefly introduced uh, in the previous slide, it's a complicated. The reactor is complicated. Complicated. If we can modify the uh, local environment or the catalyst, we may have a chance to 
to the uh, catalysis selectivity and activity. So uh, here I give you a more, uh, maybe a more clear picture of what the uh, molecular uh, tuning or the molecular functionalization is. Here we uh, use copper as the catalyst for CO2 reduction. Then we modify a layer of molecular. For example, if we modify the copper with the dihydrogen, uh, uh, dihydrogen pyridine molecule, we can tune the selectivity uh, to acetylene with high uh, selectivity of 72. And uh, if we modify the copper with a fine porphyrin molecule, we can tune the selectivity to ethanol with a selectivity of 40%. So uh, today I will be, uh, uh, due to the time limitation, I will only uh, mainly talk about the dihydrogen purity uh, modification. As we can see uh, in the right uh, figure, uh, without the modification of the molecule, uh, the ethylene selectivity is around 40%. With the modification, it, the selectivity can be improved to 72%. Uh, so this is a very uh, like a attractive result. At that time, they see the highest uh, selectivity. So we are excited about it, but we are also at the same time we are also very interested in how the molecule can tune the selectivity to to such a high level. So uh, we put a lot of effort to the understanding of the mechanism. So in order to understand the mechanism, uh, we collaborate with uh, Peters and RJP uh, group at Caltech. Uh, who has the expertise in uh, synthetic chemistry. So they help us synthesize a range of molecular precursors with different functional groups. With this kind of uh, precursor, we can use the electrodimerization method to deposit the precursor onto the surface of the uh, copper, onto the surface of the copper. So uh, it will like form a uh, para para or also also uh, dimer on top of the copper and the thickness of the dimer is around the 10 nanometer as seen from the uh, atomic uh, force uh, microscope and uh, as we can also see it's quite a uh, porous layer so uh, once we have this kind of layer uh, the immediate immediate idea for us is that maybe the uh, functionalization of the molecule can tune the local pH because in any way, once you modify the surface, you may block some block the transport of some species from uh, from the bulk or block the diffusion of the species out of the surface. For example, if we block the water. Uh, from diffusing onto the surface of copper or block the OH diffusing out of the surface, we may create a high local pH. In order to see whether this is a possibility, we uh, probe both water and OH using different technologies. For example, here, when we use the isotope label of the water as the uh, probe molecule, uh, and we oxidize the copper. Uh, but we found that the copper can be uh, physically oxidized. That means water is not blocked by the molecular uh, layer. And uh, we also use the OH desorption method uh, to detect the diffusion of OH through the membrane. We found that under an alkaline condition, we can oxidize the copper uh, easily uh, by losing one electron to form copper OH. And uh, as we can see, uh, with the modification of copper, it still has the similar peaks. Uh, this means we are not blocking uh, the diffusion of OH. And then we turn our attention to the copper, whether the mo modification of molecular can tune the copper uh, property. Because uh, if you tune the catalyst itself, you may also have the chance to tune the selectivity of the the overall reaction. So in the past research, uh, people usually tuning the crystal phase of copper. And uh, in that case, copper 1000 is regarded as the most active uh, crystal phase. 
for the generation of ethylene. Uh, so using the same technology, we found we can we can quantify how much uh, one oh oh and how much one one oh and one 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 crystal faces on top on the surface of copper. We found that uh, by modification of the molecule, we are not uh, chewing the ratio between uh, each of them. That means we are not uh, changing the crystal face of copper. And uh, we all. We also uh, examined, uh, examined the, whether the, co the molecule can tune the oxidation state and the coordinating environment of copper. Because some people have uh, proposed that to the copper plus can oxidation state or all the coordinating environment of copper. That means the molecule doesn't affect the copper or that and the doesn't affect the local pH. So we then ask us why there is still the tuning effect of the molecule. So we turn our attention to the product distribution. Uh, we found that once we modify modified the copper with the molecule, we we have higher ethylene as we we have already seen. But at the same time, we found that we have much less CO. And if we, we add up the uh, ferritin C efficiency of ethylene and the CO, we found that the total number is roughly the same for bare copper and for the molecular modified copper. That means maybe we are we are just shifting the selectivity from CO and uh, ethylene, and uh, more CO is reduced to uh, ethylene. Indeed, in the previous uh, uh, theoretical uh, study, um, people found that CO is the uh, critical intermediate during CO2 uh, reduction, which determines the, whether the product is C1 product or C2 product. And once CO2 CO is dimerized, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's favorable for the production of ethylene and, and uh, some uh, minor amount of ethanol. So we would like to, to see whether the molecule can tune the CO adsorption. So we use the in-situ Raman spectroscopy to observe the uh, CO stretching on, on the surface of copper. We found the uh, drastic difference for the uh, copper, bare copper surface and for the molecular modified uh, copper surface. We found that, uh, as we can see from the Raman peak, we found that the Raman peak can be convoluted into two peaks. One is the one can be attributed to the bridge side CO, and the other can be attributed to the atop CO. For the bridge side CO, CO bind the two CO atoms. For the atop CO, CO bind the one uh, uh, copper atom. We found we we as we can find the uh, uh, drastic difference. So we uh, invested investigate all the molecules we uh, have at hand, and we found that there is a correlation between the ratio of top CO and bridge CO and the periodic efficiency of ethylene. But we are wondering how the molecule can uh, change the ratio of top and bridge CO. So we come back to the molecule itself as we already know that the molecule does not uh, tune the copper surface. So we, 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 we pay attention to the, uh, the property of the molecule uh, uh, themselves. And uh, as we have some basic organic chemistry knowledge, if we have different uh, functional group of the molecule, the uh, charge distribution or the charge density on the molecule will be affected. So we use the uh, charge on the nitrogen atom as a descriptor to uh, plot the charge of the nitrogen against the ethylene. We again we found that there is a correlation shape uh, which has a volcano uh, shape, and uh, then we try to correlate them uh, all together. So in the previous one, we have the relationship between the top CO, bridge CO, and the uh, ethylene selectivity in the 
uh, in the bed, in the charge uh, charge plot, we have the relationship between charge and the selectivity. If we plot two of them together, and we can find uh, this relationship. This means that uh, if we change the charge density of the molecule, we are tuning the uh, top and uh, bridge CO ratio. When if we have more charge on top on the surface uh, on the nitrogen atom, we will have more atop CO. That means for the bare copper, most of them are bridge. Once we modify the copper surface when the molecule, it promotes the population of atop CO on copper. So we are still not clear about how the molecule can tune the uh Atop CO, uh, atop CO and uh, bridge CO ratio. So we use a uh, theoretical uh, calculation, uh, density functional uh, theory calculation to draw a picture of the how the molecular tune the uh, the the ratio of CO. We found that it uh, indeed injects uh, some charges from the molecule itself and uh, to the Water beside the C, beside the CO, and the water will have interaction with the CO to uh, stabilize the uh, atop CO on top of the surface. Once we have stabilized the atop CO, that means we increase the overall population of atop CO. So the atop CO uh, will combine with bridge CO to form OCCO, which means the dimerization of CO. This has a lower energy barrier compared to the two broad two bridge CO to form uh, OCCO dimer dimer on the bare copper. That means we are reducing the overall energy barrier for the uh, CO uh, o, uh, CO dimerization. But if we have too much atop CO, which means we have too negative too much. Uh, charge on the nitrogen, we will have two. Uh, we will have two uh, atop CO to be dimerized, but that that needs much higher energy, which cannot be uh, stabilized uh, during the calculation. So the best configuration for the CO OCCO dimerization is one bridge and one atop CO. So now we are quite clear about. Uh, how the molecule tune the uh, selectivity. First, the molecule donates donate some charges, here the electron, to the local rea reaction environment, which is water and the CO. And the, the richer charges can promote the population of a top bound CO. So this promotes the more energy favorable a top bridge CO, CO dimerization. Once CO is dimerized, it can be uh, finally reduced to acetylene. So now we turn our attention back to the reactor. So in our all, all the previous tests, we use a flow cell, which has a cathode and has an anode, has an ion exchange membrane, and has here has an electrolyte, which is complicated and introduces uh, the energy losses. So uh, we try to borrow some concepts from the fuel cell, uh, fuel cell field, which is uh, developed uh, more advanced. They use the membrane electrode assembly. So they remove this uh, electrolyte. So they directly contact the cathode, direct contact the cathode with the anode, that with, with the uh, anion exchange membrane and uh, the anode which means this become the zero gap uh, reactor. This will decrease the energy loss due to the, uh, due to the resistance of the electrolyte here. And it's also, uh, it's also uh, uh, avoid, the, uh, avoid the contamination of the, uh, the, avoid the impact of the contamination of the, uh, Electrolytes here, so it's is potentially uh, more stable. So here is the schematic of the membrane electrode uh, assembly. 
we the key component is here. So we put the cathode catalyst on this side and put the anode catalyst on that side and we push them together to make a, 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 them contact the very compactly, uh, compact, compactly and then we finally assemble all overall the uh, device. So here is a picture of our uh, cell, the MEA cell. So it has an area around five centimeter square uh, of the electrode. Using this MEA device, we can operate the reaction for nearly 200 hours with stable and high reactivity towards acetylene, which, which is uh, in average around uh, 64 percent, and it can deliver a current density of 80, the ethylene partial current density of around 80 milliampere per centimeter square with a full voltage of 3.65 volts, and uh, the full cell energy efficiency is 20 percent. Um, the value is uh, compared to other reports, the value is high but not good enough because as, as the requirement for the CO2 reduction is high current density, which should be around the, like at least the 200 uh, milliampere per centimeter square. Currently, we only achieve 1800, uh, 80 milliampere per centimeter square. This is one challenge. Another challenge uh, is the carbon balance, carbon balance and uh, uh, both of the challenges will be covered in the following uh, slides. And uh, additionally, there are other challenges, for example, the energy efficiency is not that high. So we, tr we firstly try to aim to resolve the low current density uh, problem. So uh, in order to uh, improve the reaction rate, which is the current density, we use the nanotechnology method so we managed to modify the uh, molecule on the nanoparticle of, of copper. So uh, with the assist of the um, enamel, so we can prepare a ink of this composite material, and then we use the electrode deposition method to prepare the uh, homogeneously modified the copper with the molecule. Uh, with this kind of nanoparticle, we can have a current density of more than 200 uh, 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 milliampere per centimeter square, which can be uh, potentially uh, more uh, uh, compelling for the industry of application. And uh, another uh, issue, uh, another challenge is the carbon balance and uh, the carbon crossover. So here is the uh, detailed uh, uh, mass. Uh, flow uh, of the MEA, we can see we have CO2 inside, goes in through a humidifier to introduce some water into the uh, cathode with the product out. Uh, this is separated by the uh, membrane of the catalyst, uh, of the cathodic catalyst and the anodic catalyst. Here we have some electrolytes flowing through the uh, anode side to facilitate the uh, the context of the catalyst. So, in the detailed reaction of this uh, of this uh, MEA device, we can see that here in the cathode we have a CO2 reduction. But at the same time, once we reduce the CO2, we will generate a lot of OH, as we know from the like uh, secondary school chemistry. So, the OH will immediately react with CO2 from carb uh, carbonate and the carbonate will go uh, across the membrane to, re to react with the dissolved CO2 in the anode side to form uh, bicarbonate. And uh, at the anode, so we, will, we are oxidizing water to generate the proton, and the proton will react with the uh, alkaline uh, bicarbonate to form CO2. That means if we check, if we check the CO2 pathway. The CO2 goes from the anode side and uh, across the membrane in the form of carbonate and bicarbonate. And at the anode, it will form uh, CO2 together with a uh, generated oxygen. That means if we calculate in a more quantitative way, 
we if we convert one CO2 into product, which is acid, we will lose uh, uh, we will lose three CO2 molecule onto uh, into the end of the site. That means in theory the CO2 utilization is only 20%, 25% at most, but in reality the number is much lower. That means we are wasting majority of CO2 in the form of the CO2 generated in, in the anode. So if in the anode we only generate the CO2 is fine, we can recycle the CO2 back to the cathode, but it's a mixture of CO2 and oxygen. That means we are introducing extra uh, cost to separate the CO2 from oxygen. So this is not a good, and uh, we needed to address the CO2 crossover problem. One way is that we decouple the CO2 reduction to acetylene into two ways. One is the CO2 re reduction to CO, the other is the CO reduction to acetylene. Why we decouple the CO2 reduction? Because if we generate O, and CO will react with water and uh, electron to form acetylene, but uh, CO will we, we not react with OH. That means we don't need to worry about the CO crossover to the anode side. So in the separated way, first we do CO2 to CO, and we use the uh, uh, high temperature uh, solid oxide uh, uh, electrocatalysis. We can achieve very high energy efficiency, high selectivity, and uh, high current density for this process. This process has been developed uh, much more advanced compared to pure CO2 reduction uh, in room temperature. So using this CO, we can further reduce the CO into acetylene with the molecular modified copper. We can achieve high selectivity, which is more than 60%. And we can also maintain the overall energy efficiency of these two processes together to be competitive to the direct CO2 to acetylene, which is around 20%. And we can achieve high current for this process. So this is one of the strategies to solve the CO2 crossover uh, problem. Uh, of course, we are trying to develop more uh, uh, alternative ways to uh, address this question. So in summary, we have developed the molecular modification method to tune the uh, CO2 reduction to acetylene, acetylene, to acetylene. So we are wondering, can we, mo can we use the molecular to tune other intermediates for the CO2 reduction? Because in the tuning of the CO2 to acetylene, we only tune CO, which is K to the acetylene, but there are many intermediates in the overall process. If we can tune other intermediates, we may have a chance to tune the selectivity towards methanol, maybe, and towards uh, like uh, ethanol or other high level uh, products. And uh, we are also asking ourselves, can we tune the selectivity or tune the activity for other reactions using the molecular tuning stresses Let's say, for example, the oxidation of methane is very challenging in the overall chemistry field. Can we do this? Or can we uh, like reduce nitrogen into ammonia in a more uh, selective way using this uh, strategy? So if we go back to the uh, CO2 reduction uh, topic, so we are, we are working towards the commer commercialization of the overall process. But there are still uh, many challenges to be resolved, even if we have the molecular catalyst that can be uh, very uh, selective, but the selectivity is not high enough. Currently, we can achieve like 70%, but if we can achieve 90%, we, that means we are saving additional uh, 20% uh, to reduce the cost for the further production. Uh, for the further product separation. And uh, currently we are achieving 200 uh, hour stability, which is the highest uh, in the current uh, uh, literature report, report. But this is not enough for the, uh, for example, for the water splitting 
uh, technology to generate the water, uh, the device can be running for thousands of hours. So we need to be uh, at least competitive to uh, be that level. And for the carbon utilization uh, challenge, as I have said, the currently the theoretical uh, value for carbon utilization is only 25% if we, uh, for the direct CO2 to, to ethylene process, we need to uh, further improve it to reduce the uh, separation costs of CO2 and oxygen. For the energy uh, efficiency, currently we can achieve a uh, full cell energy efficiency of 20%, but based on the technology economic, uh, techno economic analysis, if we want to be uh, we want the ethylene, uh, the CO2 to ethylene process to be uh, competitive to the fossil fuel based ethylene production. We need to have an energy efficiency of at least 70, uh, 60, 60%. That means uh, we still have 40% gap. And for the scale up, currently we are using the air, electric, uh, electrode area of five centimeters square, which are much larger than the uh, traditional one. Uh, that are using uh, around the one centimeter square electrode, but that's not more than that's not enough. And if we are aiming for converting hundreds of tons of CO two per day uh, using this kind of area, will take forever. So we need to develop a large scale CO uh, two reduction device, and we also need to uh, manage the stack of a range of a number of the MEA uh, stacking together. That means it introduces additional challenges for the heat management, water management, and the electricity management, which are all challenging for the engineering aspect. So come to the acknowledgement. So all of that, the work, as I have said, uh, has been done in the science group. Uh, under the guidance of Professor Ted Salin. So I really appreciate his uh, advice. And uh, I also appreciate all the friends and the colleagues at the, in the group to help me uh, make the, such progress. And uh, I also thank the invitation of TMS. So last page now. So currently I just, uh, joined the University of Sydney, and we are still trying to focus on the uh, development of electrolysis uh, to, uh, for, for example, for the CO2 reduction and for the activation of other small molecules like water, nitrogen, and uh, methane. So this is a young team, and uh, if you are interested in the research topic and interested in life in Australia, so please come to contact me and we can see some ways to work together. So yeah, that's it for now. Okay, thanks uh, for Dr. Lee's uh, inspiring talk. Now the time is open for uh, questions. Actually, uh, I have uh, some questions from the chat box. Uh, the first question is from uh, Talo. Uh, he said, is there any trade-off between the selectivity and stability of the CO2 reduction uh, electrocatalyst? And how can you approach to the to a high current in your, uh, in your cell? Uh, have, you, uh, done also, have you also done some investigation of the single atom catalyst? And how, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, we can we can answer one by one. So for yeah, the yeah. first one, the trade-off between the selectivity and the, the durability, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, currently, um, I don't see the the competition between the selectivity and the durability because for the for the catalyst, no matter what no matter what the selectivity is, whether it's CO or uh, ethylene or even hydrogen, it's uh, it's still a reaction under like a certain rea reaction rate. That means under a certain current density. So under this reductive potential, the catalyst may under 
undergo very similar changes, for example, morphology changes, the reconstruction of the catalyst. So I, if I say the durability will lost, will, will lose, even if you, re, no matter what product you are, you are going to generate, the durability problem exists for all the products you generate. So, and uh, this is the, for the catalyst is, itself, and uh, the durability loss also comes from the overall system. So, if 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 the other component in the system, for the for example, the membrane is not stable, so it's not uh, regard related to the products you are generating. So, it's the membrane itself, and uh, the durability problem also comes from the anode. So. I think that they are separated uh, problems for the durability and the selectivity. But uh, there is indeed a trade off between selectivity and uh, activity. That means selectivity and the current density. In most cases, if we run the reaction at high current density, the selectivity will lose uh, more rapidly. So if you are running the reaction in you know, low current density, it it tends to be uh, more selectivity, more selective for one product. And yeah, this is the answer to this question. So another question is single high item. High current density. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, uh, for the high current density. So uh, currently for the CO2 reduction. Uh, people are using one is the H cell, which is CO2 to be dissolved into uh, the electrolyte. Two, the flow cell based uh, reactor, which uh, in which CO2 can diffuse from the backside of the catalyst. That means uh, the CO2 don't do not does not need to be dissolved in the electrolyte first. So the challenge for dissolve the CO2 is that the solubility of CO2 is low. It's only around 30 millimolar, which restricts the current, the theoretical current density you can, re you can reach. For example, for the CO2 to CO, you may only reach around the below 20 uh, milliampere per centimeter square. If you use the flow cell, you don't need to dissolve CO2. That means you have a chance to achieve hundred, several hundreds of milliampere per centimeter uh, square current density. So this is the answer to this question. So for the single atom one, um, currently we, for my own research, we didn't touch single atom. The reason is that for the single atom, uh, then this is the single active site, but as you can see, we are aiming for C2 products, which means uh, ethylene and ethanol, and which means we needed to have CO dimerization step. But for a single site, it's challenging for the dimerization step. Uh, so we are not doing a single item for now. But if there may be, there may be some new mechanism which uh, can have one single site but can do CO dimerization, then they see the new chemistry. I think that would be exciting. Uh, yes, uh, and the uh, same from uh, uh, Talo. He, he ha uh, his another question is how do you uh, tackle the catalyst poisoning by the carbon monoxide? Uh, yeah, and we also work on different iron exchange membranes or to prevent the crossover of fuel. Yeah, maybe the okay. the CO poisoning may be uh, interesting. Okay, CO poisoning. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it, yeah, CO poisoning comes for the noble, noble metal, for example, platinum, uh, palladium. Uh, people have done a lot of effort to address the CO poisoning problem in the fuel cell uh, field. For example, the, uh, the, what the uh, yeah the fuel cell so it's the 
hydrogen oxidation and the water and the oxygen reduction reaction and also for other oxidation uh, reaction for example the methanol oxidation or the uh, formic acid uh, oxidation so in that in those cases the co pointing is critical for the research but for the co2 reduction so if the co pointing is a problem that means it's not a good cat list for CO2 reduction because it blocks almost all the active sites. So actually, we are not aiming to address the CO poisoning problem, but we are trying to select select the different catalysts that had almost no CO poisoning problem. For example, copper. Copper has a, a weak absorption of CO. So the CO Poisoning problem is not severe for copper. If we want to do CO2 reduction using platinum, which has a strong CO adsorption, that means we are not using the correct catalyst. We need to do some modification of the electronic structure or to change the catalyst. So for the uh, ion exchange membrane, currently we are using the membrane from dioxide material which has been tested by that company using the silver catalyst for CO2 to CO. They were able to be running the reaction for around 2000 hours if I remember correctly. That means it's quite impressive result. So using that membrane we can run the CO2 reduction to acetone for around 200 hours for now. Indeed, we see the instability of the membrane, which is uh, likely caused by the uh, swelling of the membrane due to the alcohol crossover. This is a potential issue for the stability of the membrane. And this call for the development of more advanced, more advanced and more stable membrane. And uh, we, I believe we have already tested a few other membrane, but they are unpublished results. And uh, I'm not the leading researcher, so I'm not the best person to give further detail about the membrane or other kinds. Okay, uh, thanks for your uh, reply. And we uh, uh, from another another guy, uh, Heidi. I'm making a short. He has uh, three questions, but I think the first one is, uh, what the stability of your uh, molecule, <clears throat> and oh, also, sure. yeah, and is if this uh, molecule can decrease the HR or OER reactions, and then he 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 is wondering, uh, maybe. Can you give your uh, comment on the uh, when we can commercialize the uh, this this your research? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for the stability of the molecule, as we are doing the reaction in neutral environment, but the locally is still alkaline. So our first concern for the stability of the molecule is whether it can survive under highly alkaline. Condition. So we directly use the uh, concentrated uh, alkaline electrolyte for the CO2 reduction with the modification of the molecule on top of copper. We found that it shows similar uh, activity and similar selectivity. And after the reaction for several hours, we rinse the molecule and we detect the chemical structure of the molecule using EMR. And we found that the chemical structure is the same as the chemical structure in neutral environment. So we think that the molecule is resistant to alkaline condition. And another stability challenge for the molecule is whether it can survive during the long-term stability test. We have tried to test the, more, the stability of the overall system for nearly 200 hours. But um, the challenge for us is that 
after long operation, uh, the membrane of the MEA will be tightly attached to the surface of the catalyst. So this uh, does not allow us to rinse the molecular again and uh, use AMR to detect. So we didn't have the AMR information of the molecular, but based on the selectivity of the overall MEA system, it's the selectivity is stable for 200 hours, uh, nearly 200 hours. So we suppose that the molecular is still functioning functioning well in order to maintain such high selectivity. But it deserves further investigation for the longer term uh, stability of the molecular. So another question is, if I, I missed one, so the commer commercialization. Yeah, uh, yeah, the commercialization. Yeah. So the commercialization, uh, as I have said, so there is a long way to go for the commercialization. Currently, the it's still a very small scale for the CO2 reduction to ethylene. In any way, the area is only five centimeters square, and the current density. It's okay, actually, the current density. We can now achieve 200 uh, milliampere per centimeter square, which is quite good for the commercialization. But the, the, the challenging part is the one, the durability of the system, two, the energy efficiency of the system. So 200 hours is not enough. We need to be running for several thousand hours. And for the energy efficiency, currently we only achieve 20%. If we can achieve that 60%, I think uh, we will be much more promise, um, uh, optimistic for the commercialization. There is still a long way to go. Okay. And just it's not only on about the, the catalyst. Okay, so uh, for, for one, yeah, just to uh, talk about, continue our discussion on commercialization. I know there are different mm -hmm. methods for CO2 conversion. You talk about uh, electrocatalysis, there's photocatalysis, yeah. there's thermocatalysis, and how do you evaluate these different pathways for CO2 conversion uh, or from the perspective of commercialization uh, potential? Yeah, I think it, uh, currently it's good for the community to develop various uh, methods, for example, the thermal, the photo, the electro uh, conversion. And I do believe in the future, if it's commercialized, there will be multi ways to achieve this, not only electro uh, catalysis. For, for, the, uh, uh, for the thermal catalysis, the advantage is that it has been developed for so many years and uh, it has quite a standard test platform and people have more like, uh, experiments about the catalyst development and it's uh, from my understanding the test will be more simple because it's only like a two-phase system one is a gas phase one is a solid phase but for the electrocatalysis it's a three phase it introduced one more uh, degree of freedom it's more com complicated and uh, that that means we need more time and more effort to uh, develop and uh, for the thermal catalysis, I think think another advantage is that uh, it can be directly or uh, directly combined with uh, the current thermal catalysis uh, infrastructure, which may reduce the capital invest in capital cost for the overall uh, infrastructure uh, construction. That's the advantage. And uh, the disadvantage for the thermal catalysis may be it's uh, in any way it's uh, in most cases it needs high temperature and high pressure and currently uh, to provide the, this kind of uh, condition uh, the first choice is fossil fuel based energy source if people in the future can develop the uh, like a heating system and a pressure rise, pressure rising system using the renewable electricity. I think uh, there is a huge chance over there for the thermal catalysis. And for the electrocatalysis, I think the 
biggest advantage is that it can directly use uh, the renewable electricity from either like uh, solar or uh, wind. This is the advantage. The disadvantage is that it's in a much early stage for commercialization of this technology for CO2 reduction, I mean, uh, for this specific uh, uh, research area. So uh, it's still fast uh, growing in a very fast way. And uh, I believe a, in the long future, not, I mean, long, not uh, five years, but maybe 20 years, it can be competitive. And uh, actually, the water uh, water stability uh, uh, system uh, give us hope for the similar technology because it's uh, also the electrocatalysis technology. And for photocatalysis, I think a young fan may make a more <laughs> insight for this site for this aspect. Yeah, uh, actually for me, I think uh, the, maybe the, uh, currently we can rely on the electron catalysts, catalysts first, because maybe the solar uh, energy still have a very, uh, especially for the photocatalyst, the efficiency is still very, uh, very low. Uh, compare, if you compare to the natural, even compared to the natural uh, artificial uh, uh, synthesis. Uh, synthesize, yeah, photosynthesis. So, uh, yeah. So, I think maybe the now nowadays the best uh, best choice is the solar cells with the uh, electrocatalysis. But yes, for actually for uh, now I'm uh, doing the uh, photothermal catalysis. I think maybe one merit is is large scale uh, production of your uh, uh, products for maybe for uh, and it's easy to uh, scale up. You know. Uh, in now, now the factory, the equipment they can use their equipment uh, for very large scale, uh, large scale production of the, uh, for example, CO and methanol or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, we have uh, next question. We have uh, also uh, one of my concerns is from uh, uh, this question is from uh, Tian Lai. Uh, uh, he's wondering uh, about how to make sure the molecular layer can cover uniformly on the whole surface of the copper uh, catalyst. Yeah. yeah, so for this question, uh, yeah, here. So we use a precursor to prepare the molecular film on top of copper. So the precursor is the water soluble. Once we use the electrodimerization method to deposit the molecule on top of copper, it becomes water insoluble and it sticks to the surface of the copper. Uh, I understand that maybe the, the question you want to ask is whether there is some chemical interaction between the molecule and the copper surface. So we didn't detect the chemical interaction for example, the coordination between the molecule and the copper. So it's only physical contact between the uh, molecule and the copper, and it's when the vast uh, falls. So, but uh, for the test of 200 hour, it's stable on, on the surface of copper. And uh, due to the use of the membrane electrode assembly, as we can see, so we directly remove the electrolyte part and we put uh, the catalyst layer in contact with the ion exchange membrane. This uh, kind of increases the stability or increases the uh, to or maintain the stick of the molecule on the copper surface because you are pushing the catalyst towards another solid. And that means you are sandwiching the molecule between the catalyst, the copper, and the anion exchange membrane. This increases the stability of the molecule. Yeah, and uh, for the future re uh, research for the to promote the stability of molecule, I think we can also introduce another protective layer. For example, we can introduce the inert carbon 
on top of the Cochrane molecular surface to keep them more stable. I have a question. Yeah, Jimmy. Uh, hi, Dr. Lee. Thank you for your talk. Uh, as a non-expert, uh, I have two questions. The first question is, uh, is a specific technical question. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I note that you, you focus on the functionality of the biology part of the copper, copper anode, anode, right? So I'm wondering, uh, cat, cat mm. yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, have you ever tried or in any other group tried uh, to functionalize the cathode using the physical structure functionality like, uh, an idea coming to my mind now is, have you tried to mix the, mix the multiple metal together to make it into an alloy, alloy mm -hmm. type? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I may answer this question first. So for the physical like mixture uh, to create uh, like uh, alloy, I think mm -hmm. this is also a hot topic for this research and actually for other researches because once you alloy the copper, for example here, copper with uh, like a silver or uh, gold, you introduce the different uh, atoms with different uh, electronic structure and a different uh, size, it uh, can introduce, for example, strain and can introduce uh, like a ligand effect to tune the uh, local uh, electron uh, richness and uh, to, uh, to, to tune like uh, the binding between the uh, alloyed uh, catalyst with the sub substrate, for example, CO2 here. So uh, if you have uh, the copper catalyst, which has like a weak uh, adsorption of CO, you may introduce uh, uh, another metal with strong adsorption of CO2 to like uh, make it uh, like a more uh, specific uh, to the adsorption of CO2 to tune the, either the selectivity or the activity of the overall catalyst. Okay. Of course, Thanks. there are other physical uh, methods. For example, you can uh, create uh, the local uh, confined space to confine your reactant uh, in, uh, uh, onto the very close space of the catalyst to push the reactant to react on the surface of the catalyst. That's another way. Thank you. And uh, can I also ask another question? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, a very general question. As a non-expert, uh, I'm very interested in your in your research topic. Uh, so, can you give uh, an can you the uh, non-expert like us a uh, big picture of your research area? That can you name some representative group in, all, all over the world and uh, mm -hmm. use one sentence to introduce. They are, they are representative of most famous achievement. So maybe you can give uh, like the new PhD or even new new postdoc have a picture, big, big picture of your research area. Yeah, I think this picture may represent the big topic of this area. So we are trying to electri electrify the many uh, chemical industry to make it more compatible with renewable electricity. So for example, we are aiming for the electrification of CO2 conversion, and uh, some people are working on the electrification of ammonia synthesis using renewable electricity and uh, nitrogen. Some people are trying to produce hydrogen from water to generate uh, the hydrogen resources for fuel cell cars. Currently, the hydrogen comes from uh, uh, methane reform, which is the uh, fossil fuel base. So, if we, we want to, if uh, from my understanding, if I want to cover the topic, I would uh, use the electrification. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, okay, uh, due to the uh, time limitation, uh, if anyone has more questions, you can uh, e maybe email to uh, Dr. Li. Yeah. And so uh, uh, thanks for Dr. Li's uh, speech. Uh, Jen, do you have anything you want to uh, announce? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks for Dr. Lee's uh, uh, talk today. It's really wonderful, and uh, I think it's really like uh, solving the problem of our some urgent problem like global warming. And uh, uh, so th this is the season finale of uh, season one of TMS Talk, and uh, uh, you can check our website for more updates on the upcoming TMS Talk season two and our ongoing WBA Talk season one, and. Uh, also, you can check all the past talks from our website. And thanks everyone for the participation. And uh, hope to see everyone in the next talk. Yeah, thank you.